everyone. My name is Eric Hopkins, a.k.a. Joe, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So AEW Double or Nothing was this Sunday, a big, long five-hour show with, like, I think it's like, what is it, 12 matches here, if you count the uh, buy-in show for sure. Uh, but I thought I'd do a review of that, so let's get into the show here. Not a whole lot happened on Collision this week. We, I mean, good matches all the way around, and I think it set up a few uh, stipulations like the uh, Bang Bang Gang uh, setting up uh, the fact that they're going to be defending their Unified Trios Championships and stuff like that here. Uh, some things like that happened on Collision, but overall it was a setup for the pay-per-view this week. Not, that's not to say Collision is not a, a not a good show. It is a good show. I think it's something you definitely need to be watching each week because they're actually adding more story elements to Collision here lately that tie into Dynamite and to the pay-per-view. So it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, but since we got a long pay-per-view here, I'll just kind of go right to that instead and do my Dynamite review this week on Thursday morning. So yeah, here is the overall card. 12 big matches for AEW Double or Nothing that took place in Las Vegas on May 26th. 2024 on Memorial Day weekend here. I thought they had a really pretty good crowd here for the pay-per-view. I think it was like 7,000 plus. So very good crowd for AEW or Denver or nothing. I, I, I'm kind of one of those guys. I mean, I, WWE's been doing this too, so it's not a big deal to me. But at the same time, I, I do miss the days of like the the the, the sets for the pay-per-views being different than the weekly shows. Uh, so it's a minor nitpick on both companies at this point. I would like to sign it, kind of see them uh, get to a place where you know, you got these extravagant sets for the pay-per-view shows that do not resemble the exact same things you see on uh, the weekly shows. But at the same time, I understand it too. Times are tough right now, and it's probably a little cheaper to do it this way. So in that regard, it's not a big nitpick. It's just something I kind of miss a little bit, but that's just me. Before AEW Double or Nothing started, though, we got Tony Khan bringing out Martha Hart uh, with Renee Paquette to announce that the Owen Hart Foundation, uh, the Owen Cup Tournament, uh, the finals will be taking place in Calgary, Alberta, Canada on July 10th this year. And the winners of the Owen Cup tournaments, uh, the men and women's, will be earning world title shots at All in London at Wembley Stadium on August 25th this year, AEW's biggest show of the year like it was last year. So kind of what the – I understand a lot of people's criticisms. Well, WWE just did this with the Kick of the Ring tournament. So now AEW's copied WWE. That should not matter. Yet yeah, That may have been the case, sure, but this should have been the way it was from the get-go, much like the King of the Ring should have been for a title opportunity at SummerSlam from the get-go. But for whatever reason, they didn't do it. Does it matter if the idea come from them? Not really. This is the way it should be. AEW should be making the Owen Cup tournament important enough to grant title shots to give it more relevancy, much like the King of the Ring tournament got more relevancy this year under Triple H, even though he didn't announce the tournament was going to be for the championship title opportunities until after the tournament basically had already ended at that point, but right before the pay-per-view. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Shouldn't we just be happy that AEW is making the right call here? I mean, I would still like to see AEW get like a Royal Rumble type. I know they had like a Royal Rumble type uh, uh, a match to where it was kind of, you know, Similar, but it was a little different with like before, like during blood and guts and things like that. Uh, but I would like to see them do something to kind of set up title matches, maybe a double or nothing every year, since this will be kind of leading into all in. Uh, so that could be kind of cool. And maybe you could do like a rumble type thing. Now, granted, it'd be kind of early in the year, much like the Royal Rumble. Maybe you wait and do it toward the end of the year, but the Continental Classic is kind of toward the end of the year. That's a round robin tournament. So I like the stuff that AEW is using to fill in their uh, the year, their yearly calendar here, much like a or WWE has their yearly events that they like to do as well. Uh, so I want to see more of that from AEW. We are getting that new concept they tried a few weeks ago, uh, the uh, the gauntlet match uh, that will determine uh, the number one contendership for the AEW World Championship at Forbidden Door coming up this week on Dynamite. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully they'll kind of tweak it a little bit and kind of get the bugs uh, taken out of that because it obviously had its issues as well. You know, there's like 20 guys in the back, but only like, you know, seven or eight of them came out before Will Ospreay won the last one. So it kind of sucks for those guys who supposedly had it in the back, didn't even get an opportunity. I don't know how they're going to play that. Maybe they'll kind of tweak it a little bit. Maybe you got to wait till all men have entered before you can win. I don't know. Uh, that might be the better way to go, but then it might take most of the show. We'll have to wait and see how they do it this week. But at the same time, this is the right call. And if uh, you're criticizing it, uh, I, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, it, it shouldn't matter. Uh, AEW should be doing what's right for their tournaments, and this is the right move. At the end of the day, I really don't care whose idea it was first. At the end of the day, all I care about is good pro wrestling, and this is the proper way to book it. Uh, the buy-in saw Tony Storm versus uh, Deanna Perrazzo. Deanna Perrazzo defeated Thunder Rosa in their rematch after grabbing the bottom rope as leverage. So this feud must continue, it sounds like. So at the same time, I'd rather this feud kind of kind of end, but at the same time, I kind of like the idea that we don't have to constantly just rely on women's championships for feuds, for having feuds that are not revolving around titles, and I really like that. 
And WWE has been doing a pretty good job of that as well. So it, it, at the end of the day, that sort of thing actually helps women's divisions. And I think it actually expands the roster out. It like gives you a potential for, you know, matches down the line in title uh, contentions as well. So I think, uh, this could be a good thing to build the division overall and set up uh, future contenders for those world titles uh, going down the line. But yeah, fun match between the two. Uh, but uh, sounds like we're going to be getting more down the line here, possibly on a Dynamite or a Rampage or something coming up in the future. Don't know if we necessarily see, need to see this on a uh, pre-show or a pay-per-view again, but at the same time, uh, it's fun to watch these two ladies. But yeah, Deanna Perrazzo gets the one-up on Thunder Rosa here. Second buy-in match uh, featured Max Caster, Anthony Bowens, and daddy-ass Billy Gunn of the Acclaim taking on Bishop Khan. Toa Leona and Brian Cage, the cage of agony here. Uh, but yeah, before the match started, you know, obviously Max Caster did his rap and then Anthony Bowens took the mic and did his typical, you know, Las Vegas, you know, and, and he stuck his fingers out there to kind of, you know, get the scissor thing going on. But this lady, whoever was in the, in the, in the crowd uh, was not impressed. And uh, the, if you looked again later in the show, she was not there later on. So I feel like this was a plant. And this could definitely be something to tell a storyline down the line here. Obviously, someone who's not very thrilled with uh, Anthony Bowens here, she tried to, like, put an envelope that had some, like, look like uh, daffodil flowers or something around it. But Anthony Bowens saw it and kind of handed it to Daddy S. And Daddy S chucked it to the side. So it could have been a fan. But at the same time, it just feels a little – because the camera focused on it as well. And it looked as if Anthony Bowens stood there for a second, was waiting for her to put the envelope in his hand. So I don't know exactly where this is going, but this could definitely be a storyline moving forward. So we'll have to wait and see if they follow up on this on Dynamite this week or on Rampage or Collision. But uh, yeah, uh, definitely potential for a new storyline here with Anthony Bowens. Maybe this is like his long lost daughter or something. I don't know. Uh, interesting. I don't know. I know he's I know he's a gay man in real life, so I don't know what they're going to be doing with this or anything like that. But it'll be interesting to see where this goes. But there's storyline possibilities there, so I can't wait to see where it takes it. The opening match uh, between Will Ospreay and Roderick Strong for the international championship here. Uh, Osprey got a huge pop as he came out to kick off the pay per view card. Uh, Matt Taven and Mike Bennett were by the champion side, but Wardlow was nowhere to be seen just yet. The aerial assassin didn't want to wait and went after Strong while he was posing in the ring, so the ref called for the bell. The fight spilled out to uh, the outside of the ring almost immediately as both men were throwing lefts and rights. There was actually a spot here I thought was absolutely terrifying when uh, you know, Matt Taven and uh, Mike Bennett uh, were trying to you know do this uh, spot where Will Osprey literally landed on his neck. Uh, I don't know if it was his neck or his face, but either way, it uh, did not look good, and it could have definitely hurt Will Ospreay here. So hopefully Will Ospreay is okay because if AEW loses Will Ospreay, that would be a devastating blow to the company. No doubt about it. He's their biggest baby face right now and is over with the crowd, and they need him moving forward. Uh, as the kingdom tried to distract the ref, Wardlow showed up to interfere, uh, but the referee saw him and made him leave the ring before he could hit a powerbomb. Osprey took out the entire Undisputed Kingdom with a corkscrew from the top rope before going after the champ. Uh, these two men have reputations as being incredibly gifted performers, so it almost seemed effortless for these two guys to put on a banger here, and they absolutely were. It was one of the better matches of the show, in my opinion. Uh, they worked brilliantly together to deliver a high, com highly competitive uh, performance. Uh, Roderick Strong began selling a neck injury, and Will Ospreay looked concerned, but Callis fired him up and told him to use the Tiger Driver 91, which he retired against Brian Danielson because he was afraid of what he did to Brian Danielson. But, uh, you know, after Don Callis, you know, fired him up, it fired up Will Ospreay. And he looked like he was going to hit the Tiger Driver 91. But then, of course, he thought better of it and didn't end up doing it here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Strong managed to counter this at the last second to avoid the impact for sure. Uh, but uh, the aerial assassin ended up getting the win anyway after hitting a picture-perfect Stormbreaker for the win here. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Will Ospreay is your new AEW international champion. But the story they're telling here, which we'll get into in just a little bit, is that uh, Will Ospreay, being a part of the Don Callis family, technically, uh, he is uh, not listening to Don Callis. And by not listening to Don Callis, he is actually getting the wins. Uh, if he was to listen to Don Callis here, he probably would have lost this match, uh, which uh, comes uh, back into play a little bit later with Kidosuke Takeshita. So again, everybody who's going to be complaining a little later on needs to understand that they're telling an overall story arc here, and they're going to be doing that, uh, I think, again, on Wednesday night on Dynamite, as uh, Don Callis says a little later in the show, that he has a contract for a new family member that he wants to present. He didn't say to who. Uh, so again, I think this is all going to kind of kind of come to a head a little bit on Wednesday. So we'll see where this goes. But yeah, love to see Will Ospreay as the new international champion here. No knock against Roderick Strong. I was a little worried about this match when they announced it. I didn't know how Roderick Strong's uh, abilities would uh, mesh with the likes of Will Ospreay and his outstanding ability. But I thought these guys had a banger of a match to open the show. Could have been put later in the show to even make the show 
better at the end. But I thought for this crowd early on, I thought it was a great uh, start to the show and a great way to open it up for sure. But Will Ospreay is probably going to put uh, this title on the line in multiple countries throughout the world as the international champion, who, as he said. So hopefully that don't take him away from AEW. And here's the weekly television here. But yeah, I think he's going to bring prestige to the international championship, and I'm all for that, no doubt about it. Immediately after Will Ospreay went up the ramp, we've got uh, Adam Cole, who made a surprising appearance. You thought maybe he would address the fact that Roderick Strong just lost the AEW International Championship here, but that's not why he come out necessarily. Adam Cole made the surprise appearance after being hurt uh, with a shattered ankle for a lot of months here. Came out walking, looked pretty good when it comes to walking. Uh, whether or not he's ready for in-ring competition is a whole other ball game here. Uh, Adam Cole yelled at the crowd about he, how he shouldn't even be here. He pulled out the devil mask uh, before a video began to play after the lights went down. And uh, this was a video that was teasing the return of MJF, the former AEW champions music hit. And out came MJF uh, back from injury. Uh, he was wearing a leather jacket and denim vest, similar to that look that Triple H had when he returned to Madison Square Garden following his big quadricep tear in 2002. Uh, he kicked Adam Cole below the belt. Obviously not taking anything more from Adam Cole and their friendship for sure. He grabbed a microphone and gave a scathing promo as Adam Cole rolled out of the ring. And, and you know, MJF was just on fire here. You know, he was over as all hell. Uh, and obviously the crowd was eating up every bit of this. And uh, yeah, it sounds like, I don't know if this means the end of the devil storyline with Adam Cole and MJF, or this is just kind of starting to set it up for the future here. I hope that's the case because this was the most over thing on the show right after the big Will Ospreay match. This was outstanding. So if they could get these two together in the ring at Wembley at All In, that would be outstanding and make this a long build. I know Adam Cole's not 100% ready to go yet. I didn't even think MJF was 100% ready to go yet because I had heard recently that uh, you know, with the Kitty Omega going under the knife for his diverticulitis that I heard uh, you know MJF had, had, had opted to go for surgery as well uh, that he was hoping he wouldn't have to have, but then he had to take. So I don't know if that means that MJF is 100% ready to come back and compete. It sure sounded like it. Uh, but if 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 they, if they brought him him and Adam Cole out here to do this one segment and then the, neither one of them show up again for months, this is going to be a major mistake by AEW on their part. Uh, but hopefully this means that MJF is at least ready to go and hopefully he can kind of get back into action while Adam Cole continues to heal up. However, Adam Cole took a big um, you know brain buster from uh, MJF here before he left as well. So uh, yeah. MJF was also referencing the fact that no more goofy shit, no more uh, no more friendships, no more kangaroo kicks, no more idiot, idiotic masks like this, none, none of this stuff. It's just good old-fashioned MJF, all about hate, 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 and he is back. Uh, and, of course, he also referenced the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the, the questions going around about his contract. He told the cameraman to zoom in on his ankle, and he showed off this new tattoo that he got. It says, bet on yourself, and it has the uh, double or nothing chip here. Uh, with the AEW logo in the middle here. So if anybody had any questions about whether or not a uh, MJF was going to leave AEW, go to WWE, apparently that question has officially been answered. Now, uh, apparently, you know, it sounds like the um, MJ MJF has signed a contract with AEW for multi years, probably, you know, a while ago, and it's just now finally being confirmed. But it's not like they wanted to play up that bidding war of 2024 gimmick and things like that. So it's great to see MJF back. I think uh, AEW definitely needs MJF back at this point. They've got so many injuries with Kenny Omega and Adam Cole and many, many others as well. Uh, not that, that that doesn't mean they don't have a deep enough roster to manage all this as well, but I think bringing that back MJF at this particular moment is going to be a great thing and a big boost for the company. He looks great. He looks like he's ready to go. He was uh, you know, just spitting fire here, no doubt about it. And he said you could call him the wolf of wrestling because he is not effing leaving so, yeah, can't wait to see what they do with MJF moving forward. Hope that he'll be back full-time this week on Dynamite. I'll have to wait and see. But, uh, yeah, he was he was just all piss and vinegar in this uh, segment. So, yeah, love this. Hopefully we're going to see uh, the, the the feud between him and the Undisputed Kingdom uh, going down the line here. Maybe he's got to go through the Undisputed Kingdom to get to Adam Cole. As Adam Cole continues to heal up, that could be a great place for it to go as well. So we'll have to wait and see. But as of right now, this was like a big, huge start to AEW Double or Nothing. And at this point, it was one of the better pay-per-views they've ever done at this point. It was kind of hard to hold that momentum as we went through this, but uh, great, great start, in my opinion. Next up, we had the Bang Bang Gang versus Death Triangle for the Unified Trios Championships here. Uh, Jay White and Pac uh, were going to start the match, but Switchblade did the, the heel thing and tagged out, so his babyface rival needed to wait to get his hands on him. S sounds like they're clearly setting up Jay White versus Pac at one-on-one -on -one at some point. Can't wait to see that. Uh, this match uh, had a lot of great individual moments, but there was something off about the pace. Uh, things even out as the actions progressed, thankfully, though. Uh, White and Pac's rivalry took center stage, but all six men had uh, standout moments. Uh, that's when uh, Juice Robinson showed up and tripped Pac on the top rope. 
Uh, this allowed White to get the pin for his team and the Bang Bang Gang to retain their trios championships here. So, again, another guy coming back from injury, which is great to see. Uh, more guys that AEW could get back to come back uh, to their main shows is going to only boost the roster and the ratings. Hopefully, it will be a good thing for the company overall, even though I don't necessarily think ratings really matter anymore, especially once Monday Night Raw moves to Netflix and AEW gets their TV rights deals. They could end up being simulcast on Max or something like that. We just don't know. At the end of the day, what matters is if the company is making money and successful, and I know and we'll see if that ends up being a thing for AEW as well. They obviously have a new startup, and sometimes you don't actually make a bunch of money until years in, so we'll have to see where it goes. But happy to see uh, Juice Robinson back here, no doubt, and I think uh, that puts the advantage on the, the Bang Bang Gang or the Bullet Club Gold or the, the Gun Club or whatever they're calling themselves now as they now have the four-man group back together in full force. So can't wait to see what they do with Juice Robinson and the club moving forward. Next up, we got Tony Storm versus Serena Deeb. Uh, yeah, I thought this was a pretty good match between these young ladies here. There was even a spot in the match where Tony Storm delivered a pile driver off the middle rope. And then, of course, uh, she hit the Storm Zeros for the pin and the win over Serena Deeb. Serena Deeb didn't seem too over with this crowd, which I think is a shame. I think Serena Deeb... Uh, is definitely an underrated wrestler. Uh, her character maybe needs a little bit of work for sure, uh, but I think uh, the character work of Tony Storm is going to outshine anyone on the uh, AEW women's roster, except for maybe you know Mercedes Monet or Willa Nightingale right now. Uh, but uh, Tony Storm is doing a great job with her character here. I love what they're doing with the Timeless uh, character, no doubt about it. Uh, but there's also a spot in this match where it looked like uh, Mariah May was going to throw in the towel, uh, but Luther stopped her, but then Tony Storm saw that Luther had the towel, so she blamed Luther for possibly throwing in the towel instead. And remember, Tony Storm threw in the towel on Mariah May previously, so Mariah May was potentially teasing that she was going to do that to Tony Storm. Uh, so again, they're just setting those seeds up to where Mariah May and Tony Storm are eventually going to go nose-to-nose -nose here. Probably jealousy over the Women's World Championship, no doubt about it. They even did some backstage photos where Mariah May was kind of holding the AEW a women's World Championship as Tony Storm was recovering following this match, and Mariah May was just kind of looking at it with longing eyes. So again, setting up those little teases and setting up those Cs to where it's going to pay off eventually. This particular match I didn't quite understand here. Uh, the next bout saw a grudge match between former members of the Best Friends, uh, Orange Cassidy and Trip Beretta. Uh, Trip Beretta come out to some new heel music, which kind of riffed off the old Best Friends uh, gimmick and said, you know, best Trip Beretta instead of like Best friend. You know, so it was a lot of fun. They obviously had a different color scheme and uh, different graphics as well. And Orange Cassidy also come out to his old interest music instead of Jane that he's been using lately, uh, went back to uh, his old theme music because he's kind of on his own again as well. So yeah, for the first couple of minutes, uh, Cassidy and Beretta went shot for shot. Whatever one man did, the other man did right after, but Beretta finally got the upper hand, but not for long. Uh, they did a good job of telling a story. This just didn't feel like a series of spots. Uh, it felt like everything they did made sense for the few. The pace was a bit slower than expected in some places, but not in a way that hurt the match. Uh, Orange Cassidy was able to roll over Beretta into a pinning combination to get the win after failing to beat him with his usual finishers because uh, obviously Beretta knows him very well, so he was able to counter. Uh, Beretta looked absolutely devastated after the loss. He didn't even try to get revenge. He just slowly walked away with his head down through the crowd. Uh, Rene Paquette even tried to ask him something about this afterwards. Trent just said, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. He did push Rocky Romero out of the way as well as he left through the crowd. So, where this goes, I don't know. To me, I couldn't understand exactly why you couldn't allow Trip Beretta to get this win here. This one, to me, was like more so than the Konosuke Takeshita thing, which I'll get into in a minute. But I thought Trip Beretta, he's been losing, losing, losing. And again, this could tie into the Don Callis story. I think the contract that Don Callis is going to be offering to a new family member is to Trip Beretta. So, but it makes no sense, though, because uh, Don Callis has kind of been costing people wins here, like Kanosuke Takeshita. And he's going to bring in someone else like Trip Beretta, who's also been losing into a loser, into a loser faction. So I don't know, you know, I mean, outside of Will Ospreay, no doubt about it. But to me, it just feels a little weird that uh, that, that would be a thing. But uh, at the same time, I would like to have seen. Trip Beretta get this win over Orange Cassidy because Orange Cassidy doesn't need the win. Obviously, Orange is you know highly established. He's a great wrestler. He's going to be just fine, even at a loss here for sure. But if they've got a storyline to where they're taking this with Trip Beretta, I'm willing to give it my patience, and we'll wait and see where it goes. But at the same time, couldn't quite understand this one. This one kind of shocked me a little bit. Next up, we had the triple threat match for the FTW Championship. Chris Jericho versus Hook versus Katsuyura Shibata. Uh, the learning tree went right after Hook when the bell rang, but Shibata and Hook were almost working as a unit at times. Chris Jericho even dumped a bag of dice on the mat, but Hook and Shibata ended up suplexing him onto the pile uh, before he could use them to his advantage. There was a scary moment when Shibata and Hook were supposed to fall onto Jericho and go through a table off the top rope, but the table didn't break and everyone crashed down hard here, no doubt about it. 
Uh, but uh, Big Bill eventually showed up and helped Jericho escape Red Rum, but Hook uh, put him through a table at ringside. Uh, a masked man showed up and attacked Shibata before revealing himself to be Brian Keith. Uh, Brian Keith, the bounty hunter, showed up to help uh, Chris Jericho here as Jericho stole the win and left without checking on Keith and Big Bill. Uh, Jericho get, gets the uh, pinfall on Katsuyura Shibata, who was in the trash can at the time. Uh, there were some people saying, well, his shoulders wasn't down. Well, the, the trash can was. His shoulders were down under the inside the trash can but anyway uh but uh this was predictable but still mostly entertaining keith uh, joining jericho doesn't really make a lot of sense i understand that uh so i we are going to need a little bit of an explanation for this but i think what they're doing here is I, what i hope they're doing at least is brian keith's gimmick is the bounty hunter what i hope is jericho hired him as a bounty hunter to you know help him win this match uh but however there was a triple threat match last week on dynamite where you know Brian Keith lost to Katsuyura Shibata and Hook to set up this triple threat match with Jericho. So maybe Brian Keith is just not happy with Shibata and Hook. That could be a thing too. But he also got in Jericho's face, I believe, on Collision and told Jericho that, uh, you know, it ain't the last you've seen of him. And Jericho's like, okay, thanks. And just smiled as uh, Brian Keith walked away. So we'll see where this goes. But yeah, Brian Keith, I just don't know if it, it, may, it makes a lot of sense for him to join the learning tree with the Redwood, uh, you know, Big Bill and Jericho here. I mean, you could do that. But based on what we've already seen, it makes more sense to me if Brian Keith can kind of, kind of start taking these bounties and, you know, you know, people putting out hits and Brian Keith is the one to collect. Kind of like the way the Young Bucks was putting out bounties uh, on Danielson and FTR in recent weeks. So we could possibly see Brian Keith kind of do that gimmick. That's what I hope they do. If they if they put him with the learning tree, it'll, it'll take some explaining as to why that makes some sense. So if that's the case, we'll have to wait and see what they say. But uh, at the same time, all, all things considered, I thought this was a, 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 a fun match for sure, especially with the dice, especially the spot where Katsuyura Shibata was taking the dice and was throwing it at Chris Jericho. And then uh, uh, we had uh, Hook also doing the same thing. Because remember, Katsuyura Shibata got a puck thrown at him, a hockey puck thrown at him from Chris Jericho right in the face. So Shibata was trying to chuck these dies at Chris Jericho in his face. So I thought that was a big money moment for sure. But uh, yeah, love to see that. And I thought this was a lot more fun than it really, really should have been, all things considered. So great job by all these guys all the way around. But yeah, definitely want some explanation on the Brian Keith stuff. The thing about Chris Jericho and Brian Keith, uh, if he does end up joining the learning tree at least, uh, it makes some sense because Jericho's been doing a good job in his AEW run here kind of building these factions with some younger talent and kind of building them up uh, through, uh, you know, his, his, uh, his popularity as a, as a superstar who's been in the business now for like 33 some years. So it, it makes some sense to bring in a younger talent like Brian Keith. He's done the same for like Sammy Guevara and uh, Jake Hager and uh, many others throughout his tenure here in AEW. So it would make sense for Brian Keith and big bill to also learn from that learning tree, so to speak. So we'll see where they go. But uh, yeah, I think this is a good start, but we just need to, they need to tell us what's going on here for sure. in the coming weeks, Next up, we had the big eliminator match for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship, John Moxley against Kanosuke Takeshita. This was the third singles match between these two guys. Moxley won the first two in 2022, so big Takeshita was looking to make sure he didn't make that a hat trick. Uh, but uh, Mox came into this match with an injured arm as Takeshita uh, focused almost all of his in offense on it to exacerbate the injury. They worked at a slow and methodical pace so Moxley could sell every big move. Uh, but once he began to build some momentum, they started moving a bit quicker. Uh, the majority of this match was a dominant performance from Takeshita. He was probably responsible for 90% of the offense, but Mox still ended up getting the win here. Uh, yeah, this was definitely different uh, from everything else on the show in a good way. Even though Takeshita would have benefited from a lot from a victory, he still came away from this looking strong. Uh, that, that, that's the thing everybody's stunned about, is that Takeshita took the loss here. There's a lot of reasons why. Okay, first of all, let's let's break this out. Apparently, uh, John Moxley's got an IWGP World Championship match, I think, with Gato. I think that's who it is. It might be in New Japan. I don't know exactly where it's at. But he's already got a match scheduled for that title, which is why this was an eliminator match, first of all, and it wasn't for the title. Uh, which to kind of was to kind of make it a little more unpredictable. If you said it was for the title and that match was already booked, it would have been predictable as all hell that, that, that Takeshita was going to uh, lose because Moxley was going to win anyway. Now, making an eliminator match, you could have had Takeshita go over and set up a title match against Moxley down the line. But what if Moxley's dropping that title at that pay-per-view? If Moxley's dropping that title at that pay-per-view, it wouldn't make any sense for Takeshita to beat him for a title shot. So in that regard, it makes sense to why Moxley won. And if he drops the belt and then Takeshita would have a title shot against Mox and Mox wouldn't have the belt, wouldn't make much sense at all, would it? Not to mention, we're also playing into a larger storyline here with Takeshita and Don Callis. As I mentioned earlier, Don Callis uh, was responsible or was trying to get Will Ospreay to you know do the Tiger Driver 91 against Roderick Strong at the beginning of the show. Will Ospreay ignored Don Callis' advice and he won. 
Don Callis tried to do something similar in this match with Kanosuke Takeshita, and Kanosuke Takeshita tried to listen to Don Callis, and then in, in, in turn, Takeshita lost this match. So the storyline is, Will Ospreay's not listening to Callis, he's winning. Takeshita is listening to Callis, and he's losing. So, so again, if you're doing this stuff with the Don Callis family, possibly on Wednesday, where Callis is going to be bringing in another family member, this could all play out on Dynamite this week. Just have to wait and see what they do. But I think everybody who's getting all mad at AEW for not allowing Kanosuke Takesh to get a win over Mox here needs to understand. You want them to tell stories? This is them telling stories. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, oh, well, God, they're telling stories, but I wanted Takesh to win. Well, you're they're telling stories, and now you're still mad. Pick a lane here, okay? So they're going to have to, you're going to have to be patient with this and see where they're going with it, okay? I think, yes, I agree. I think Takesh needs to be getting some wins, no doubt about it. But in this particular instance, I see why they did it. Um, Takeshita may actually break away from Don Callis at some point. We'll have to wait and see. He is definitely popular with the fans. So we'll have to see if that ends up being a thing or not. But for this night alone, there was a lot of reasons why John Moxley won this match. And re and you know, obviously he it wasn't for the title, but setting up the championship match, he already had a plan. Takeshita's got a storyline going as well. And obviously th there's reasons for it. That's all I'm saying here. So everybody just needs to calm down a little bit and understand that eventually this is going to play out, I think, and it'll be good in the long run. Uh, but what's that? Uh, just have to be patient. Takeshi is going to get his time. Don't worry about it. I know he's kind of had some comments in the recent past that he's not having a lot of fun. Uh, but I'm pretty sure Tony Khan is high on him here. I wouldn't think he'd be booking him against the likes of John Moxley, booking him to actually look good, even in losses here. I think, you know, Tony Khan's going to have some plans for him coming down the line here. I think we all just need to be patient. Next up, we got Adam Copeland versus Malachi Black for the TNT Championship here in a barbed wire steeled cage match here. The most gruesome stipulation on this card. Uh, for sure, as Adam Copeland came through the stage surrounded by a ring of fire, just like he used to do during his brood days in WWE. Uh, they wasted no time going for some of the weapons that were in the cage. Both men were bleeding within minutes, but Malachi Black's wound looked worse. They eventually used a barbed wire bat to inflict more damage upon each other here. There was even a spot in this match where it looked like uh, the House of Black who come down to help Malachi Black went over and stood next to Adam Copeland as if they were going to side with him against Malachi Black. And then, of course, Brody King laid out Adam Copeland with a huge clothesline. There was a lot of rumors going this week that Malachi Black could lose this match and then be leading into possibly leaving w or AEW and going to WWE. And maybe the House of Black would side with uh, Adam Copeland here. So they kind of played into those rumors a bit. I don't know if Malachi Black is leaving or not, but at least uh, for one night, they kind of played into it. Then, of course, uh, the House of Black ended up helping Malachi anyway. So I don't know if that's necessarily going to be a thing or not. We'll have to wait and see on that one. But yeah, this was great, all things considered. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, there was a bunch of weapons, a bunch of stuff they were doing here. Um, there was even a spot where they put uh, this big old, you know, crown of thorns, as it were, on Edge's forehead here. Uh, so yeah, it looks like, you know, it kind of evo evoking the images of Jesus as well, you know. And uh, there's even a fan in the crowd dressed up like Jesus who's been at AEW shows before. And I guess, uh, you know, it, there was a big moment there where the crowd was kind of chanting his direction and stuff. So uh, I don't know how he felt about it or anything like that, but they were definitely playing off that sort of imagery for sure. There was a spot in this match where Adam Copeland climbed to the top of the cage and dove off after he wrapped Malachi Black in barbed wire on a table. Uh, Copeland attempted to do an elbow drop off the top uh, through the table, but also landed on his feet instead of on top of Black. Uh, this is a great way to blow out a knee, especially for a guy who's 50 years old or blow out an ankle or anything in your leg. He came down straight down with his legs extended I hope Adam Copeland wasn't hurt here. Uh, I know that he was limping after the match was over, so I hope he didn't tear something up badly. That could be a career ender for a guy his age for sure. Uh, but uh, he definitely should have laid out and landed on uh, Malachi. I don't know if he kind of decided midway through that he was going wanted to abandon ship. By then, he was already committed. I don't know. But this looked painful, and I hope and his, he, he did bend his knees when he landed, so hopefully he didn't do any major damage. But when he was uh, leaving the, the ring, he was definitely limping, so that concerned me for sure. So well wishes to Adam Copeland if he is hurt. Apparently, he is injured from this spot uh we just don't know the severity of it just yet so we'll have to hopefully wait and see on uh, wednesday maybe we'll have an update by then for sure uh but yeah while this wasn't as gruesome of about like swerve versus hangman page in a texas death match it was still a violent and brutal affair all three men of the house of black ended up beating up uh, adam copeland for a little bit until the lights turned red and some eerie music began to play and that is when we got the arrival of gangrel from the brood from back in the day in the uh, early to mid 90s here uh, came up through the ring and attacked house of black adam copeland used the barbed wire to assist to apply a cross face and malachi blacked out and the ref declared the rated r superstar adam copeland as the winner as he retained his a uh, aew tnt championship here with the help of an old friend so, yeah, interestingly enough, 30-some uh, years later, 
uh, the brood, all three members are technically a part of AEW right now with Christian Cage uh, being the third member. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was fun to see. Uh, I know uh, Adam Copeland had this plan to have Gangrel kind of reappear in WWE, but obviously that did not go there. And I guess uh, he decided to do that uh, storyline here uh, in AEW. And I thought this was great. It was pure chaos from start to finish. Uh, both men are going to need some stitches after all this is over. So very fun match, as we all expected it to be, because Adam Copeland and Malachi Black are great performers. But obviously everything else going around with the barbed wire and the weapons and the cage and all this sort of stuff made it even better. So fun, fun match. Like I said, happy to see Adam Copeland. He also got his wedding ring back from Malachi Black that he got. Uh, is wearing in this photo here too so yeah good to see that as well no no beth phoenix or anything like that uh to come help him get the ring but at the same time a lot of fun we just hope that adam copeland is perfectly healthy here and if malachi black ends up leaving i guess it's a great way to send him off uh much much better than potentially the way they may be sending off becky lynch on wwe if she doesn't resign her contract uh but at the same time uh, yeah i don't think malachi's going anywhere i really hope he don't because I think he could be a great singles uh, competitor here, especially going for a world title at some point. So hopefully we'll see that going down the line too. But well wishes to Adam Copeland. Next up, we had the first of three main events, which was the TBS championship bout between Willow Nightingale and the debuting in ring of uh, Mercedes Monet here. The champion was looking to establish dominance early by forcing Monet to the corner as the crowd chanted for both women who were uh, both over in this match. Uh, Willow Nightingale had control for a long time, but once Monet began working on her leg, the TBS champion found herself on defense. This was a surprising hard-hitting fight that made both women look incredibly tough, which is even more impressive because they had to follow the most violent match of the night, and Mercedes uh, hasn't wrestled in like a year. Uh, Willow Nightingale had the match won with a doctor bomb, but Chris Statlander and Stokely Hathaway, who were both at ringside cheering uh, Willow Nightingale on, accidentally distracted the ref. This allowed the CEO to hit her finish for the win. Uh, so, yeah, so accidentally, which we're about to find out, was not so accidental. Mercedes Monet won the TBS championship, as many of us expected her to do. Uh, obviously, there were some reports going around that she has been completely cleared for competition since December. Obviously they wanted to make it a big deal for her debut. They didn't want her just to wrestle random people on weekly shows in that regard. I understand it. However, if you've had her under contract all this time and you're just now debuting her, you wanted to debut her at Boston. I understand that too. That makes a lot of sense. And this is the five year anniversary. So I get that. I get that point of it too. There are a lot of fans out there though, who would have rather seen Mercedes Monet earn this, earn this title match and go through some wins to get to Willow Nightingale, but I guess they wanted to just make it an impactful debut. And I, I get that, but at the same time, I get the criticism too. So if you're one of those people who criticize it as well, but again, as I've always said, if you're going to criticize this and if CM Punk ends up coming back right away and getting a world title shot against Drew McIntyre or something of that like, I don't want to hear the complaints then either because if one's okay, the other one should be okay too. Otherwise, Punk should have to go through the ranks as well. Uh, but we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. But for one night, I thought, this was a great highlight for Mercedes Monet. She looked great in the ring. That's where her, her biggest strength is, is her in-ring capabilities. Her, her promos have never been her biggest strength. They're not bad or anything like that, but Mercedes Monet is definitely good in the ring, and I'm happy to see her as the TBS champion, and she'll be carrying this brand as well as we got a lot of good champions here on AEW right now, a big stack card when it comes to their championship roster. So if you follow Chris Statlander on her social media, you probably noticed that she put a big collage of pictures with her and Willow Nightingale on her social media prior to the pay-per-view on Sunday. So smart wrestling fans kind of can already tell where this is going to go. Uh, so if you saw this earlier on, you kind of realized what was about to happen. Uh, so yeah, it looked like she was supporting her girl, but when things like this sometimes happen, it oftentimes leads to a heel turn. And that is exactly what we got here after the match was over. Uh, Stokely Hathaway yelled at Willow for losing, uh, but Statlander shoved him to the mat to kind of sell the fact you know, that, she was still her friend, but then as she was trying to assist Willow Nightingale up the ramp, she attacked Willow as Stokely looked on with a huge smile. So, yes, we got the aforementioned uh, Chris Statlander heel turn, which I have been calling for weeks uh, since the Dynamite I went to uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, they've been teasing who it was that attacked Mercedes Monet. And they also were teasing the fact that who attacked Willow Nightingale in the back as well. Still ain't got no answer on that, but I've been calling since that happened that it was Chris Statlander and appears that that could very well be the case. We'll find out when Chris Statlander gives her why Chris Statlander, why speech on Dynamite most likely. So we're going to be seeing that as well. So yeah, this is going to be a good thing for Chris Statlander as well. And Statlander and Willow could have their own feud as Mercedes moves on to another contender, no doubt about it. So yes, good thing for the women's division all the way around and an end of an era for uh, the, the friendship bracelet uh, team here, no doubt about it. And I thought it was really cool when Willow came out. She had a huge, uh, you know, friendship bracelet that Stat was holding out as well. So, again, yeah, just kind of, you know, 
and I guess at the end of the segment too, Statlander took her friendship wrestle that she had around her wrist and she threw it on uh, Willow Nightingale too. So great heel turn. Loved every bit of this. Good things to see for the women's division. The second main event in the triple main event for AEW Double or Nothing had Swerve Strickland defending his AEW World Championship against Christian Cage. They were slow to make contact, but once they locked up, they were vigorously fighting to see who could take control. They ended up making a clean break and locking up again after coming to a stalemate. They took a different approach than a lot of the matches we saw on the show. They took their time and spent a lot of time taunting and sizing each other up instead of going from 0 to 60 right away. Uh, Swerve was his usual impressive self, but this match was a reminder that at 50 years old, Cage is still capable of putting on fantastic performances. After the ref was tricked into ejecting Prince Nana from ringside, Nick Wayne and Kill Switch attacked Swerve Strickland. Uh, the ref eventually wised up and ejected the entire patriarchy, leaving the two men one-on-one. Uh, the mogul tried to use the steel steps to his advantage, but ended up being sent into them by Christian Cage. Uh, Nick Wayne returned and hit a cutter behind the ref's back, but Prince Nana chased him through the crowd with a pipe. Uh, but yeah, this may have gone on a little longer than it needed, but at the end of this uh, thing, we saw a great spot with uh, both guys running full force at each other off the ropes, and Christian Cage looked to maybe been diving for a spear, but that's when uh, Swerve Strickland hit a giant house call. This was one of the greatest house calls I've ever seen him hit. The split-legged kick to the dome is absolutely outstanding, and I loved every second of this. It made me jump off my couch, no doubt. Uh, but uh, yeah, after several false finishes, Strickland hit the Swerve Stomp, followed by another house call, uh, with Cage down on the ground for the win here to, to defend his AEW World Championship for the first time on pay-per-view. Uh, so, yes, great, great match between the two guys. Some intricate storytelling leading up to it as well. Uh, the match was kind of stuck on a big pay-per-view and toward the end of the show, so the crowd was a little tired coming off the mercedes Monet and the Malachi Black-Adam Copeland match. But I thought, all, on the whole, I thought these guys had a solid, great uh, World Championship match here uh, to kind of round out the show toward the end. A lot of people complaining that a, uh, Strickland wasn't on the main event as being the world champion, but I kind of understand why after we saw the anarchy in the arena match because there was just so much chaos, there was no way this match was going to top it, so I thought they placed it in the right spot. Well, to end the show, we had the aforementioned anarchy in the arena uh, we, as Jack Perry, Kazushka Okada, and Nicholas and Matthew Jackson made their entrances. Dax Harwood, Cash Wheeler, Brian Danielson, and Darby Allen attacked them to get the action underway. Uh, Matthew Jackson grabbed a mic and made the production truck play the Bucks music as they fought. But Danielson put a stop to that saying, turn this shit off. And he, and he had them play the final countdown instead, uh, which the crowd was completely into. They were singing it as they were just fighting all over the arena here. They even had a quad box at one point showing where we had like a, we had eight guys in the match and each of them were kind of split off and paired off to go through different parts of the arena here. The song played for a long time as all eight men battled around the arena. As the song continued and continued to play, uh, we got to a point where Matthew Jackson grabbed the microphone again and said, yo, turn the song off. Well, I, I got to pay $200,000 every time they play this song on a loop. So, man, we're on a budget here. So that was a hilarious line. And, of course, they turned the crowd or the sound off. Uh, but once the song stopped, the crowd started chanting, we want music. Uh, <laughs> so it was kind of hard to follow the action at times until everyone made their way back to the ringside area. But that never stopped it from being entertaining. Uh, yeah, de definitely trying to sum all this up uh, would be almost impossible. Uh, obviously, there was a spot where, you know, Darby Allen and Jack Perry were fighting all the way in the back where everybody else was fighting in the arena. Uh, obviously, there was a spot where Darby Allen uh, threw Jack Perry into an ice bath, which was weirdly set up outside on like a street. That was kind of weird, right outside the building. And that is, of course, uh, you know, we also had like a giant trash pile set up with like pallets and, you know, wooden boxes and things like that. Uh, so, Jack Perry was kind of looking around and he eventually found this bus that had the word scapegoat, his gimmick, uh, you know, painted across the top of it. And he used this bus to run, try to run over Darby Allen because obviously Darby Allen in real life actually got hit by a bus in New York city. Terrible thing, but he had a broken nose and stuff because of it. And Darby Allen was clearly not a hundred percent coming into this match, but it appeared to look like that. Uh, the scapegoat Jack Perry had ran over Darby Allen. Clearly, he must have missed because Derby Allen was not uh, hit by this bus, but Jack Perry was knocked out from the looks of things from the impact of hitting this big pile here. So he was taken out of commission for a little bit. We didn't know exactly if Darby Allen had been run over or not. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as, as the match continued here, as all these guys continued to fight through the crowd, they eventually, eventually made their way, way up to the ramp area uh, and onto the stage. Jack Perry ended up coming back, and he grabbed Tony Khan from the gorilla position or whatever they call it in AEW. Uh, it was the exact same spot where Tony Khan was seated during the infamous CM Punk Jack Perry brawl site uh, footage that was released by AEW. So Jack Perry kind of looked back to the camera and, and, as a wink, wink, ha ha, nod, nod. But he grabbed Tony Khan and he drug him out to the rampway area where all these guys have basically been laid out at this point. 
and uh, he shoved him down the rampway. And that is when, of course, when Darby Allen emerged with a flamethrower and he set Jack Perry on fire. Now, for all you fans out there going, oh, my God, or even those for you people who have not followed wrestling a whole lot, maybe watching this or whatnot, Jack Perry had taken a big dunk in an ice bath, so he was completely watered up. Now, I'm sure between that time and the time he came out here, too, he was also put uh, all this flame retardant goo and stuff on, wearing flame retardant pants, and, and Darby Allen was clearly just lighting his pants on fire. He was not trying to get his arms or his face, but the flames did kind of pop up a bit here and there, but it was, a, it was an outstanding image to see, but this was completely rehearsed, completely the plan. Uh, there was even video of Jack Perry online who's been practicing this, practicing this since March to set himself on fire, so this is obviously something they've had in mind for a long, long time, and Darby Allen, being the absolute psychopath he is, is the perfect person to pull off this uh, this whole uh, segment here, no doubt about it. Uh, but of course, you know, Jack Perry runs around like he's on fire a little bit on the on the screen. Then he starts to roll around, and that, of course, when the Young Bucks had a set of fire extinguishers, they put out both Jack Perry and Darby Allen's flamethrower here to kind of take it out of commission here. So as that you know was going on, they had all these doctors ready to make sure that they were safe. This is the safest way you could have done this spot. So if you're complaining about this, understand they took all the precautions in the world for this stunt that no one would get hurt. So everybody just needs to calm down a little bit for that regard, in my opinion. But yeah, this obviously led back to in the ring. Obviously, you know, Jack Perry and Darby Allen was down for a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Bucks and FTR and Brian Danielson and Okada was still doing things in the ring. Uh, the Bucks even brought out some of their new shoes that they had, and they had tacks uh, stable to the bottom of them. They ended up hanging Darby Allen by a cable upside down in the ring about that eye level. Uh, it didn't really raise him up too long, but he was hanging upside down for quite a while, so all the blood had to have been rushing to Darby's head, which can really cause some damage if he ain't careful or definitely make you pass out, no doubt. Uh, but uh, he, he agreed to do the spot because Darby's a psychopath. Uh, all things considered, with Darby, this is probably the more tame stunts he's ever done, no doubt about it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they ended up super kicking him with these, uh, the tacked uh, shoes, uh, giving him the uh, Young Bucks super kick party, uh, and that kind of knocked out Darby a little bit. He's just hanging there for a while. This ended up uh, leading to a spot at the very end where Jack Perry recovered from the flaming spot to come into the ring and hit Brian Danielson with a running knee, which is Brian Danielson's own move, and he pinned Danielson to win the Anarchy in the Arena match here. So, again, Brian Danielson being very um, unselfish here, and uh, putting over the younger talent in Jack Perry to continue his rise up the ranks as uh, he's now a big big time over with the crowd after the whole CM Punk's uh, the brawl that he had uh, backstage back at All In last year. So, uh, yeah, this is definitely setting up uh, Jack Perry and the Elite to continue their run here as they uh, vanquish the AEW team here, so to speak. And, of course, they lowered Darby down, and the doctors checked on him, and he appeared to be okay. Uh, hopefully everything's fine. I'm sure they checked on him. They, they, they said they checked on him. They checked on everybody in this match. It seems like the only one who really come out of here that I understand might have had an injury was uh, Adam Copeland. Uh, so uh, definitely well wishes to him. Like I said, hopefully it's nothing major. But uh, this was a great way to end the show. This was absolute chaos. And this is why Swerve Strickland could not go on last because they had to continue. Uh, they, they destroyed the arena, so to speak, doing this whole segment. It was a lot of fun, depending on if you like this type of wrestling or not. But if you're a fan of the big chaos, the big brawls, and not the technical stuff as much, you would absolutely enjoy this. This was absolutely brutal this was uh, it, it was it, it's hard to describe what this was but it was probably one of the best if not the best uh anarchy in the arena match that they have done especially since the original so i highly recommend you go check out aew double or nothing they've been it was a long show absolutely but like i said before uh in my wwe recap this week i know wwe only had like six matches on their king of the ring card uh aew had like 12 if you count the buy-in uh, it's, it's one of those things where AEW is still charging $50 for their pay-per-view shows, and AEW you can watch it for like $10 on Peacock. So it's not as big of a, a, a financial investment to watch a WWE show. So WWE doesn't, has a give, doesn't have to give you as much. AEW is doing a good job of giving you the most bang for your buck when you support them and pay them for a pay-per-view, at least until they get a uh, streaming deal with Max or whatever they may be going on to hopefully put their pay-per-views on them as well. We'll have to wait and see, but I think uh, for a big-time show that, you, that they're asking you to pay money for, Tony Khan wants to give you your money worth, and I think he did a great job at that. So I thought AEW Double or Nothing was a really good show. Uh, it wasn't the best AEW Double or Nothing they probably put on ever, but I thought it was a really good show. It was probably one of the better shows of the weekend, in my opinion. 
Uh, definitely a long show, but at the same time, I understand why. Uh, but comment below. Let me know what you guys think. Are you guys excited about the direction of AEW right now? Are you excited for some of the returns like MJF and Juice Robinson? Hopefully one day soon we'll get Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker and some of those uh, wrestlers back as well. Comment below, and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And until my next AEW review, guys, which will be Thursday morning for AEW Dynamite, take care and God bless.